G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you, I do hope you are super well. In this episode I want to talk about this epic lens, the 400mm 2.8 ED VR. Launched in the August of 2007, we're going to explore is this lens as legendary today as it was back in 2007. Today we're shooting on the Z9 with the 50mm 1.2, shooting at 180th of a second with an aperture of 3.2, and that's so we get me and the camera in focus. We're shooting here today at a local oval because this is one of the obvious places that you will find a lens like this being used. For sporting, absolutely spectacular. Where else would you find this lens? Well, wildlife might be the most other obvious place. But there are some other places that I can think about. I purchased a lens similar to this lens that came out at a similar time to this lens, which was the 200 to 400 millimeter f4. Superb lens, it looks the same, it's got the same sort of build as this lens, and I actually use that for concert photography. For about a decade I worked with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and I photographed almost all of their performances for something like a five-year period along with doing all sorts of other stuff. And what I needed to be able to capture everything, and this was in the days before mirrorless, and yes you could get baffle, baffling for my D4 at the time, or my, my D810s, that sort of gear. But it, that was hard and that was cumbersome. So one way to work around it was to get at a distance. And when I was shooting actual performances, I really did need to be at a distance. One way that I masked the sound of my camera was to listen to the music and photograph during some of the crescendos, and that was fine. But being at a distance was imperative. But of course, these are low light situations. And lenses like this, my 200 to 400 f4, and this 400 millimeter 2.8, superb for low light situations. And thus, there's a number of uses. There's all sorts of different people that will use this type of lens. You'll also see it in news gathering. But beyond that, and I suppose not a lot of copies of these lenses are sold for this type of reason, but I certainly could imagine this lens being adapted for cinematography. It's a very affordable way to get a full frame, a 35 millimeter lens, and this has extraordinarily high optical quality. The lenses like this could have been used manually, and then you can absolutely manually dial, and we can see it right here, we can manually dial the focus that we need. A lens like this can be used for quite a number of different applications. Wildlife, birding, sports, event, photojournalism, and potentially cinematography. And of course me, well, I will use a lens like this for cityscape and landscape photography. And I certainly took my 200 to 400 out to use it that way, and I will definitely be taking out this lens to use that way. So what are the fundamental differences between this lens and the lenses that have come since? There's been one more F-mount lens after this version, and then we got the Z-mount. This is the creme de la creme of optical brilliance, performance, designed for action. And I think some people who have been new to photography or new to watching YouTube, or the fact really is that YouTube is new, like this lens, this lens came to life around the time that YouTube was starting to come to life. And some people might not realize that lenses were fast 15, 20 years ago, and they were performing extraordinarily well. I, I think maybe some people think everything exists in the mirrorless age and everything is kind of AS. And what's AS? After Sony. When actually there was so much going on in the photography world, BS, before Sony. And this is testament to what DSLRs, what Canon and Nikon and others were capable of in absolutely cutting edge performance. Now these lenses, as we know today, they, th this, this lens in the Z version, and there's also the 600 mil version, these are the most expensive lenses that you can buy for the Z mount and for any mount. If you get a 400 2.8 or you get a 600 F4, they are the most expensive. 
Th this was no different. In the day, this and the 600 and 800 as well that you could get, these would have been the most expensive lenses. And thus, because you pay such a premium and because they do one thing, 400 mil, 600 mil, 800 mil, this lens, this 400 mil lens, it does 400 mil better than any other lens of that era. And the realities are with using this lens, and I've used the latest 400 2.8Z with the built-in teleconverter, there's really not a lot of differences when it comes to optical excellence. This is an extraordinary lens. It focuses fast, it's very sharp, but there are some differences and we're gonna talk about that. And this is gonna help us talk about one of the differences that I think we'll find between this 2007 lens and the 400 that came out just a year or so ago. I think it's a 2022 lens, is flare. I think that's one place we'll find a difference. The coatings and other design changes within the modern lenses really affects flare. And so this lens has a huge lens hood to help minimize that. But how often are you shooting into the sun? And quite frankly, I like a bit of lens flare. Even so, it's fantastic to suppress it. Yes, I agree, that's awesome. At the end of the day, I'm not that worried if there is some lens flare. And plenty of my images actually have lens flare in them. I think that's one difference. Another really fundamental difference between this lens and the most modern version is the weight. The new lens, I think, is something like 60% of the weight of this lens. And it's like three kilos, around three kilos versus around five kilos. It's a big difference. And if you're choosing to hand hold a lens like this, that extra weight, well, that is gonna fatigue you quicker. And that is something that's changed with every iteration of this lens is it has gotten lighter maybe something like 10 to 15% lighter each time they've updated it. So that's another big difference. When it comes to chromatic aberration, I think this lens does a super duper good job and you don't see a great deal of it. Even so, it's as old as it is. Another thing that's quite exciting about putting this lens on a Z9 as opposed to say a D5 is that Anecdotally, I've been told this lens actually runs faster on a Z9. So today, even more performance is being squeezed out of it. Now, is it as fast as the latest one? I'm not sure of the actual differences because it's been about two years since I've used the Z400 2.8, but I can tell you this is very fast. It's designed for wildlife. It's designed for sports. And those motors are being driven hard by the Z9 through the F to Z version two adapter. I'm not left wanting. I can get sports, no problem. And of course, this lens has a lot of switches on it, which is what the design aesthetic was for Nikon in this day and age. It's interesting to see Canon, Sony, even Fuji, they continue to have a lot of switches and Nikon has minimized this and put a lot of it into the eye menu. It's all here. And we do have some other buttons around the body for recalling focus. And we also have around this other side here, the memory set. So you can set the memory position. On this very pitch here, I did some cricket photography and this lens spectacular optically, really, really brilliant. Considering the price differential, I think the, the new 400 2.8 is around $24,000, somewhere in that vicinity. That's actually the price of a small car in this country. Whereas a lens like this can be picked up for four, five, 6,000 Australian dollars, somewhere in that order. So you're talking about it being significantly less expensive. Optically, it's all you need. Like. Both lenses are very sharp. I think the more modern lens, the way that it cuts through the atmosphere is a little bit different. Flaring is a little bit different. Chromatic aberration, I don't think it is. This lens's capacity to give you a sharp image quickly is absolutely there and very similar to the 400mm Z. The other big differential is the built-in teleconverter and that is a super useful component of the new lens. The ability to be able to jump between 400 and 560, literally at the flick of a switch, it works very seamlessly 
And from an optical perspective, there really doesn't seem to be any change with those modern lenses. That's pretty cool. Now, this lens successfully takes the 1.4, the 1.7, and the two times teleconverters. And the 1.4 and the 1.7 work super well. But you do have to unmount the camera and mount that teleconverter. You might be saving something in the order of 18,000 Australian dollars, which might be something like 10,000 US dollars. And quite frankly, it might be worth it for the optical brilliance. And another consideration with this lens is stabilization. The stabilization is not the same. The modern lenses are far more stabilized and they work in concert with the Z8, Z9, ZF and all of the Z cameras that have in body image stabilization. Now, what this means is it's quite a difference in stabilization. Of course, this is offset a fair bit by the fact that this lens really most of the time needs to be on some sort of monopod, tripod, or some sort of structure. You're not going to be hand holding it most of the time, and that means a lot of the difference is offset. But I can still see a difference. I don't think it's a deal breaker. And then the only other thing that I would really take into serious account because this is optically good and it's fast and in most shooting conditions it's going to give you a really similar experience optically is the weight and that is if you're in the field and you're hand holding very difficult to do this for extended periods with this lens you probably want some sort of rig mount monopod tripod fluid head if you're doing sports and some type of other tripod head if you're doing birding and wildlife and the fact that mirrorless breathes new life into a lens like this not only do we think that it focuses a little bit faster but optically we are getting all of the brilliance through the f to z adapter and it's pretty extraordinary and the fact that you can now get a lens like this and bring it into the modern age and get face detect and bird detect and all of those mirrorless advantages, along with shooting 8K video and even more, I think this lens is a really super fine choice. Is this lens as legendary as it once was? The answer is absolutely yes. From an optical perspective, this lens still delivers. And if you can handle the lack of built-in teleconverter, and that little bit of extra weight, which makes absolutely no difference when you're on a tripod or you're on a fluid head like we have here, or you use some other monopod or support structure. Even a bag, even a, even a bean bag, I think is a good option for certain types of shooting. There are lots of little kind of monopods and pods that people use when they're using wildlife and lying down in the sand and so on this lens still delivers and i just want to repeat the fact that this lens existed came out was here was legendary years before mirrorless was ever a thing interested in this lens i absolutely think it's an option and just maybe go to the gym and do a few extra weights because it is heavy but it is legendary it will not let you down if you're looking to deliver speed, action in low light situations, or you just want some short depth of field at a distance. Short depth of field, on the field. I have thoroughly enjoyed using this lens. I really look forward to sharing more about this lens, where it came from, and more about what it can do. Please do let me know in the comments below, what more would you like to hear and see about this lens but yes it's legendary yeah focus is extraordinarily fast and focusing from about 20 feet to about 100 feet extraordinary extraordinary it just it's instant it's instant it's really interesting to contemplate what focus motors did Nikon put in this lens back in 2007, and it was probably designing it in 2005 or 2004. But they always knew it's for sport, and they knew it was for wildlife. These are fast paced, this is action. And the reality is humans running and moving and jumping and whatever they're doing and animals, they haven't gotten any faster in the last 15 years. And so Nikon put the tech in here to keep up 15 years ago, and it's still keeping up to date. This is extraordinarily cool. 
I'd love to know what you think about these extremely premium high-end lenses. Have you had any in your life? Have you used them, played with them? What do you think of them? And are they a realistic and possible or probable choice in today's mirrorless world? I'd love to know your thoughts about that because in the case of this lens, the answer is absolutely 100% yes. All right, well, it's been so good to see you. And if this is your first time here, I would love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like. All right, bye for now.